So we continue uh, our discussion with momentum transfer. Uh, on the last lecture, uh, in the context of a film flow, which I introduced in the context of uh, continuous casting of steel, and uh, this was our mold, if you remember, mold wall, and then we have this powder filling here, uh, contained between the mold and the descending. So this is the strand, basically. So this part is the slab or the bloom, which is solid. This part is the mold, and this is the film. I made a small little volume element, and I did uh, you know, a momentum balance over this small volume element. So I introduced to you the shell momentum balance in the context of a 1D flow, in which my Z coordinate was in this direction and my y was in this direction. And I said that this is the width of the film. And through shell momentum balance, I derived this equation, the z component of the velocity, which is a function of y. And then I have written that this was the expression where uc is the casting speed constant casting speed or the bulk motion of the descending strand multiplied by, so this is a dimensionless distance, y over delta s, and this is, uh, I think I wrote it like gd, and then we have two mu, and then here we have This was the expression I derived. And I have also shown you that how to integrate this expression over this cross-sectional area, which is delta y multiplied by the distance l, and thereby derive what is known as a volumetric flow rate. And I have also shown you that how to have an expression of average component of the motion along the z direction. Whatever I did was in the context of a one-dimensional flow, if you remember. And also, in order to derive this equation, I have used that constitutive equation as a Newton's a law of viscosity, and there I have converted the shear stress or the you know, uh, momentum flux uh, in terms of the corresponding velocity gradient and the viscosity or the dynamic viscosity of the liquid, if you remember that from the last uh, lecture. Now, <coughs> I have set up, if you remember, this control volume far away from the entry region and far away from the exit region, because in the entry and the exit region, uh, you know, the kind of flow that I have depicted, one dimensional flow and the flow, and this is a streamwise direction. The flow in the streamwise direction is the most predominant one. So, typically, what happens is that when you have, if you try to consider here at the entrance and the exit region, in that case, you really, this, uh, this sort of an equation will no more be valid. So, the entrance effects, the control volume has been selected at such a location where the entrance and the exit effects are not pronounced, okay? And in that context, I will introduce a terminology later, which we'll call as a fully developed flow region. Along with the momentum conservation, I also dictated, I also told you that we have to always satisfy the mass conservation equation. And the mass conservation equation, if you remember, that gave us this expression, telling us essentially that uz is not a function in which uz represents the z directional velocity. So uz, not a function of z, essentially implies that the uz, <coughs> if you go down, everywhere the uz is going to be same. And as I said, this may not be true, particularly at the entry region as well as the exit region. So we have established this control volume far away from those two regimes. So therefore, we can see that there is no acceleration which is happening along the x direction. This essentially implies that the flow is invariant along the z direction. It is constant everywhere. It is neither accelerating nor decelerating. We have had this one-dimensional equation, and if you, we can also do, you know, we can have a generalized control volume. For example, this is an idealized scenario, and in practice, the control volumes are going to be uh, actually three-dimensional. So 
the equation that I have derived to you, or if you remember the Newton's law of motion which forms the basis. So if you write that the mass times the acceleration is equal to the sum of the forces. So this actually can be written in three different directions because we were considering only along x direction or the z direction, the motion along in one direction. So I have written this equation, the momentum balance along the z direction. So it has become basically you know, a scalar equation. So the direction has already been specified. But in principle, when you will talk about three-dimensional scenario or actual flow processes, then what you are going to have, you have you are going to have a momentum conservation equation. So this will be then represented like this. And I will have one component of this equation along the x direction one component along y direction and the other component. So we will have momentum balance along the three direction. So the one equation is the characteristics of only one dimensional problem, but two and three dimensional problems as we will see, we will have momentum conservation along x direction, momentum conservation along y direction and momentum conservation along z direction. Newton's law of viscosity I have introduced and in that context I have also told you that what do you mean by Newtonian liquid? as well as a non-Newtonian non -Newtonian or a powerful liquid. Now, the shear stress that I have represented, if you remember uh, tau, I would say in our case, and this was represented in terms of that is the Newton's law valid for parallel flows. But if you have a multidimensional flow, in that case, this the same equation can be written in terms of the other velocity gradient becomes also. So then we have another scale of velocity which is coming into the picture which is u and that is related. And this, as I said, this essentially represents the direction of the shear stress and this represents the plane on which. So it is actually y plane which means the y axis is the normal to the plane. So we, this is actually, you can see that on this particular plane in this direction, the y axis as I have indicated is normal. And this is the region of higher velocity because the plate is being moved in this way. So the liquid velocities are going to be decreasing or the film velocities are going to be decreasing as we move from here to here. And as a result of which we get zero velocity because this represents a stagnant world. So momentum, just like heat flows from a region of higher temperature to lower temperature, momentum also flows from a region or diffuses from a region of higher momentum to a region of lower momentum. So the flux of momentum is actually in this direction, so which is opposite to the y, and that's why we always represented it in terms of a negative, with a negative sign, and that I hope you all of you must be knowing. Now, Vic, if you to revise your you know, basic knowledge, so if you remember that velocity is a vector quantity, so it has i, j, and k components. On the other hand, stress components are tensor, so there are two senses here. One is z and the other is y. So it not only gives you the direction, but it also tells you, you know, which is the plane on which it is working. And in a three-dimensional context, you can see that we can have nine different components, tau y z. The replica of it is going to be tau z y. Similarly, you have x y, you have, uh, you know, uh, z x. And so also, you can have stress components like x x, which of course, which we do not represent like this, but we say that this is to be represented as a normal stress. So there are altogether nine components in the stress tensor, okay, and that six are shear stress and three are normal stress. And since the shear stress components, you know, uh, are symmetrical, so therefore essentially we'll have you know, six different stress components in the context of a three-dimensional flows. Now, with this background, let us now introduce some characteristic features of the flow. And I, as I have said, that I would like to first talk about the fully developed flow. So a flow is said to be fully developed when we have the flow is a non-accelerating flow and the pressure gradient is constant. The pressure gradient along the streamwise, if x represents the streamwise direction, streamwise direction means the direction in which the flow is really taking place. So the pressure gradient along the streamwise direction, if it is constant, 
That means there is no net pressure force, so the full fluid is non accelerating, and in that case, we can say that we will have. And the characteristics of the fully developed flow is that or ux is not a function of x. So, what we have basically done here, our flow, the flow we have considered, we can see that this has been because this was shown to be is equal to there is one atmosphere at the top, one atmosphere at the bottom. So, there is virtually no pressure gradient, del p del x was 0, so which is constant. And we have also shown that the mass uh, from the mass continuity point of view that the z component of the flow is not really a function of z. So, therefore, what we have essentially considered is the fully developed flow. So, we have considered one dimensional fully developed flow and the way we have written, uh, you know, uh, if, you, if, you, if you remember that uh, we could write the derivatives in terms of, for example, <coughs> Or we can take out. So, this is a conservative form of writing. If you remember, particularly I wrote yesterday, if you, you have to visualize when you, you know, listening to me, that I wrote an equation on the left hand side was momentum input and output, on the right hand side were the sum of the forces. On the right hand side, I had the pressure force and I had the gravitational force. On the left hand side, I had x direction momentum, z direction momentum input, and the y direction momentum. Input and the y direction momentum input term was represented like this, the net flux in the y direction. I could have taken this out if you have constant property flow, in that case mu is no more a function of z. In that case, I say that I have represented the equation in a non-conservative form, which is valid when the properties remain constant. So, if it is an isothermal system, if the mind has a constant pressure because mu is a state property, so mu could be represented, this could as well be written as. And then we say that we have treated the flow as a one dimensional flow. It is a steady state flow because there is no derivative of time that appeared in the equation. It is a constant property flow the way, way I have treated it because it is pressure temperatures that are constant and it is also a fully developed flow which is far away from the entrance region and so on and so forth. Steady flow basically the six, you know the terminology that I introduced essentially indicates that when we have any, in a, any parameter which is not a function of t. So, this is where phi could be any parameter velocity, pressure. So, nothing is changing as a function of time then we say that the process is under steady state. For example, now the population in this room is under steady state because nobody is going out, nobody so the configuration everybody is occupying the same seat. So, therefore, I would say that we have the population and the sitting pattern which looks which is invariant for the you know next 45 minutes I will be lecturing. So, it is in a steady state mode, but the moment the bell will ring and you will start getting up the population is no more in a steady state because some people will be going out another new batch of people will be getting into the class. So, this is going to be a different scenario a time dependent process itself. So, we will never see the time derivative appearing in governing equations when it is going to be a steady state process. We must understand that when we encounter particularly conventionally the space derivatives, space means x, y and z, we encounter in fluid dynamics most of the time you know second order derivatives particularly when we are talking of diffusion processes. On the other hand time appears as first order derivative. Okay, because in time is a marching coordinate. You, once you cross, go to 10, 10 past 10, you really cannot go back to 10 o'clock. On the other hand, in space, you can walk forward and you can walk backward. That is the meaning of a second order vis a vis a first order uh, derivative. So, we have introduced several terms. The next term that we want to introduce is a axisymmetric or a symmetric flow. The mass conservation and the momentum conservation that I have represented in the context of a film flow was explained in the context of a Cartesian coordinate system because that was the most suitable coordinate system to depict you know uh, the geometry 
in which we are interested in finding out the flow pressure gradient or the volumetric flow, the average velocity and so on and so forth. But we will never always encounter only the Cartesian coordinate system. For example, you know if you imagine that well I have a cylindrical shaped bloom which is being cast. Here I have considered casting of a rectangular cross section bloom which I have indicated yesterday through my drawing which I have represented here. So, and the section is only represented, you cannot see the slab and the entire drawing, but if you recapitulate, then you could see that you know the slab was having rectangular configuration. But we do not always cast slab. For example, in industries we can go and we can cast round billets and round blooms also. So that when we cast round you know, the, the, the strand is cylindrical in shape and the mold is also cylindrical in shape, and the film that you know is between the descending strand and the mold, it is also having a rim shaped as opposed to a rectangular film. So, in that context, I will not be using the Cartesian coordinate system, but I will be using a cylindrical polar coordinate system. So, therefore, momentum conservation equations that I have represented here for equivalent scenario, equivalent scenario means one dimensional, okay, fully developed flow, constant property flow, steady flow. In cylindrical polar coordinate also it is possible to derive and that we will demonstrate later on in this course, particularly when we solve the problems. And similarly, you know if you have sphere for example, in a spherical coordinate system, you want to analyze one dimensional flow past a sphere in a vertical direction, then you will choose a spherical coordinate system and again you will say that the flow is one dimensional, flow is steady state, flow is uh, fully developed and so on and then you can analyze the whole uh, scenario. So, equivalent equations can be written depending on the coordinate system you choose. So, the moment you read a problem, your objective is to identify that in which coordinate system the problem is to be represented. So, you level the coordinate system, you level the velocity and that is the starting point and then you define the problem whether it is a 1D, whether it is a fully developed, whether it is a constant property, whether it is a steady state and so on and so forth. In that context, axisymmetric flow is encountered for example, and there is another word we can use also a symmetric flow that also I will be. Let me first tell you this symmetric flow. Suppose if this is move hypothetically move speaking, if the slab is moving with a speed of uc, in that case and also I make hypothetically the mold is also moving with you see okay the same speed in that case in the, the flow in the film is going to be symmetrical about the center line because whatever is the distance here is the distance here whatever is the boundary condition on this surface is the same boundary condition the problem exhibits a symmetry okay and there is a line of symmetry even in the case of the Cartesian code. In many cases, we will see when you deal with many complex problems, three dimensional problems, understanding of this symmetry axis is very important because then I do not have to do the calculation for the entire domain, I can just do it on the half side and then I can replicate it and we must know the symmetry axis means that the velocity profile will pass through a maxima or a minima and in this case, because the basic nature of the equation is going to be parabolic in nature. So, it is going to be exhibiting you know this equation will no more be applicable. This equation it was derived when this is stagnant and this was moving, but now this profile which I have drawn here okay, which is which exhibits symmetry about this particular line okay, the gradient is equal to 0 here at this particular point. This is the solution when we will have both the mold wall as well as the strand moving at the same rate in the same direction. And then we have everything because the domain span this is delta s by 2 and this is also delta s by 2. So, therefore, the span of the domains are identical, the boundary conditions on the both sides are identical and therefore, I can say that <coughs> we will see a symmetry and that is basically we say that this represents a symmetry axis and at symmetry axis we apply for example, we used a non-slip boundary condition here and said that the boundary condition at this surface is equal to fluid velocity is equal to 
the solid velocity. Similarly, here also fluid velocity is equal to solid velocity. This velocity and this velocity are absolutely identical. But if you want to solve only for this domain, then I require one boundary condition here and I require another boundary condition here because then I, because I am solving only for half of the domain. And as you know, if there exists a symmetry as the drawing itself is explaining, you know, we will have the gradient of the dependent variable vanishing at this particular uh, point itself. So, similarly, in cylindrical polar, polar coordinate system, axisymmetric, we use the word axisymmetric flow. This Cartesian coordinate, whatever is the symmetry flow, we will label it in terms of r theta z coordinate system as a axisymmetric flow. The axisymmetric flows are those flows, mathematically speaking, where we have no dependence on theta. So, if phi is any variable, then I would say, mathematically speaking, phi is not a function of theta. So, if you, if you, if you take theta represents, you know, uh, 360 degree here. So, we have 20 degree, whatever is the value of theta. 60 degree, there is the same value, 100 degree, 180 degree is the same value and then you go to 240. So, it is not changing whatever is the value of theta, you know move the whole circle, the value of the theta does not change. That is what is the meaning of. So, when a parameter phi is not a function of theta in r theta z coordinate, we say that the process or the parameter exhibits phi exhibits an axisymmetric uh, property in the system. You can imagine for example, the same problem when you have a flow through a long pipe for example. So, the fluid is flowing here into the pipe and now I have. So, the cross section here is if you, if you draw like this particular end, this is the circular section and this represents the center. So, what it essentially indicates, so this, are, this is all wall, this is the wall of the cylinder. This is the wall of the cylinder and at the wall, the velocity of the fluid is going to be 0 because the wall of the cylinder is going to be 0 and here we can see that because this point is also at r, 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 synonymous to the case, this side is also delta s by 2, this side is also delta s by 2. The velocity here is identical, the velocity here is identical all over theta, the velocity is going to be is equal to of the fluid is going to be is equal to 0. So, therefore, about you know axis. So, it becomes basically a two dimensional problem. So, we do not have to really go for three dimension. So, because it is r direction and this is z direction, this is a streamwise direction. So, r theta z will essentially be represented by r z which is essentially a two dimensional domain theta dependence will vanish because of the simple fact that it exhibits. Now, if the boundary conditions are different for example, it can happen, you can imagine that if the same problem is heat transfer, in that case we can say that if this part of the domain is maintained at a temperature of 100 degree and this part of the domain is maintained at 80 degree centigrade obviously, the top half and the bottom half thermal characteristics are not identical. So, I want the domain lengths to be identical, I want as a function of theta all the boundary conditions to be identical and then only I can say that it exhibits an axisymmetric property. So, if you have similarly, if you say that sir, the it is a half cylinder actually, it is not a full cylinder through which the flow is taking place, then this is certainly not an axisymmetric because you know it is only from here to here that we exhibit a symmetry, but really you know below the axis we do not see because it is a half cylinder, it, the geometry itself is not symmetrical. So, therefore, the flow properties will also not exhibit a symmetry. And same discussion can come in the context of uh, spherical geometry also. So, we can identify that an identification of a symmetry axis or you know an axis symmetry in a problem gives us lot of advantages because then a three dimensional problem can be rendered to actually a two dimensional problem as we will see. And even under certain cases, 
It appears to be a two dimension, but the moment I will make a control volume here, far away from the entrance region, this can even become a one dimensional problem as I have indicated in this particular case. So, considerable simplification is possible, you know, in terms of finding out that only function of r itself. So, actual geometry appears to be an r theta z, but then we find out that theta is not important because there is excess symmetry. And then we find that, well, we are in the one dimensional domain, okay, far away from the entrance region, flow appears to be fully developed. Of course, we will test whether the pressure gradient is constant, whether the whether there is zero acceleration and so on and so forth. And if you find out that yes, it is indeed fully developed here, in that case, the two-dimensional problem then will be reduced to one-dimensional problem. So that is going to be a piece of cake to solve the problem itself. Now, so we have introduced several terminologies, Newtonian flows, non-Newtonian flows, steady flow, unsteady flow, fully developed flow, uh, then we have axisymmetric and symmetric flows and also there is another uh, important thing which we would, uh, you know, that the flow is uh, incompress compressible and incompressible flow that you may have heard already incompressible or compressible. A fluid may be incompressible or the fluid may be compressible and the property is that the rho will be changing, the density of the fluid is changing. Now the density of the fluid can change because of temperature for example. Suppose if you are you know, studying a uh, flow problem which is not isothermal, in that case and if there is a variation in temperature then obviously the density is going to be changing. But that change in the density, you know. Uh, particularly in the context of metal flows are not appreciable and also uh, that we do not deal as an incompressible flow. More so I would say the gases when you have Mach number greater than you know, the gas is traveling at a speed even though it is an isothermal problem but the gas is traveling with a Mach number more than one as it happens in the case of you know sonic booms etc. So, you can find that the flow can really become compressible where even though the temperature is constant, you may not, you know, globally speak, speaking temperature is constant, you may not see that the density is constant, density may be varying. So, flows in which density remains constant are going to be termed as the incompressible flows and the flows in which, and if you have compressible flows, in that case the density is not known to you to start with, the density will be changing as the flow takes place. So, with the flow, we have used for example, momentum conservation, mass conservation and then to find out this row in such problems we will require also an equation of state. Now, let us go to an equivalent three dimensional scenario. If the control volume in an actual geometry or in an actual flow system, if you try to draw a control volume, that control volume is essentially going to be three dimensional in nature. You consider flows in any furnaces, ladles, etc. We do not have, unfortunately, in metallurgical engineering or metal processing reactors. We have very small, not so small in the sense, you know, uh, small size maybe with regard to the size of an aircraft, but not so small. We can have 3 meter into 3 meter diameter vessels. The blast furnace could be very high, 100 meters, you know, uh, tall, and so on and so forth. So, in even if you consider that we have small reactors, uh, you know, like a basic oxygen steel making converter for example, this could be holding about 200 to 300 tons of metals and this could be about 5 meters and this could be about 8 meters or something like that. <coughs> and there is really not a predominant direction of motion. In this particular case, what was happening that the film was moving downward, there is a predominant direction of motion, one dimensional flow. The cylinder that I have drawn here, there is a streamwise flow, this is the z direction, this is the r direction. So, there is a 
predominant direction of motion. But if you take our systems, you will not find that there is any predominant. The flow is taking place all in the three direction, always in the three direction. So we have multidimensional flows and therefore the task is you know, much more comprehensive than uh, what I have indicated. In such context, I would also like to introduce one term, but a little later that the flows can be, one more classification could be that the flows could be laminar and flows could be turbulent. Okay? And between laminar and turbulent flows, there could be transitory flows also. Those details we are not going to discuss. As I said that we have only five lectures to finish the entire thing. So I have to be very concise in giving you the relevant informations. So in our systems, the flow is uh, also turbulent and I will discuss a distinction of laminar and turbulence I will bring in a little later, not at this particular moment, but you can, after incompressible you can write one more point, turbulent flow and laminar flow. So the volume elements here are essentially three dimensional in nature. So the moment I say three dimensional, so as opposed to one single component of flow in our system, we will have, you know, if we use a Cartesian coordinate system to describe. In that case, we can say that we will have three different components of motion in the three respective. Or if you are comfortable, you have to look at the geometry and you can say that, sir, why you are applying a Cartesian coordinate system? This, what is the cross section of this? If the cross section, for example, here, you know, is a circular cross section, this appears to be, you know, a cut portion of a cylinder actually. So therefore, a more appropriate coordinate system could be the R theta. So I would say VR, V theta, and VZ this could be an appropriate choice of coordinate system. There is an important task in, you know, formulating a problem and writing the governing uh, equations of momentum and mass balance. So the three velocities are going to be existing in all our systems. So we really do not have to deal, these are for classroom exercises that we basically consider one dimensional equation, solve it by hand, but in reality we will have, you know, momentum conservation equation. So we will write Newton's Second law in the x direction, Newton's second law in the y direction, Newton's second law in the z direction, and we will have three momentum balance equation. And mind it, on top of these three, we will have always the mass continuity because I said every fluid flow problem has to satisfy the mass continuity equation that is an essential requirement. So we can do the same thing. So we can construct now a three-dimensional volume element which may be, say, it is very easy for me to do, you know, always do with a Cartesian case, okay? And then you can say that let this be the volume element and you can say that this, this is something like you have x direction, this is something y direction and this is something like z direction. And now we have momentum flowing in, in this direction. Okay, momentum going out in this direction and in this we have a velocity component Vz. In this we have a velocity component Vx or Ux, whatever you may write. Okay, and in this case we have a velocity component Vy. So we have Vy getting into this, Vy momentum, Y momentum getting into this, Y momentum going, getting out, X momentum getting in, X momentum getting out z momentum getting in, z momentum getting out. And then you have, there are six different, you know, six different phases and you have shear stress components on this, normal stress components on this. If you apply the pressure gradient, if you apply the gravity forces, you can formulate an x direction momentum conservation equation, a y direction momentum conservation equation. So the forces will also have, for example, the gravity forces will have only a component along the z direction, the components of gravity is going to be zero along the z x direction and y direction. So the x direction momentum balance equation and y direction momentum balance equation and z direction will look different. They are not one and the same equations. Okay? Similarly, if you consider as in the earlier case, if pressure gradient, viscous forces and gravity are the only forces which are applicable, in that case we can have again you know, a similar equation which can be written, I will just write it because there is no time to do the derivation. These are available in standard textbooks. So the starting point is you consider a three dim dimensional volume element in Cartesian coordinate, find out which are which phases, then say how the momentum is getting in, how the momentum is getting out, 
from the system, what are the various forces, apply the Newton's second law of motion along x direction, along y direction, along z direction and formulate the three. Similarly, into this control volume, you can say mass coming in and mass going out, mass coming in and mass going out in the three you know, directions you can take the net efflux of masses and you can formulate the mass continuity equation. If it is a, you know, if there is net change in the mass in the system, then you can have a rho term varying with time, but then if you assume that it is an incompressible flow that the density remains constant, that means whatever mass is, total mass is coming in must be equal to the total mass which is going out and that is going to be reflected if you write down the equation. Now, of course, because you are talking of a three-dimensional equation or three-dimensional momentum conservation, you will not get ordinary derivatives. Earlier, my equations I wrote like this, okay, that But now I am going to not write ordinary derivatives, I have to write because it is a three dimensional problem. So the mass continuity I will write a little bit lower so that you know you can see it. The mass continuity equation if you do the mass balance, so the name is we either say it is a mass continuity or mass conservation equation. So the mass conservation we can say that equation will look like. net rate of accumulation is, is equal to, I write it in an expanded form, okay. So, <coughs> rho times ux this represents, each of these terms represents the net efflux of mass along x direction, y direction and z direction and this represents the net rate of accumulation. And as I said, if I am dealing with an incompressible flow, most of the time in metallurgical engineering we will encounter incompressible flow and then I can say that this term is equal to 0. So essentially what we are left with as an expression for mass continuity is this. If you remember now, if we say that this y ui or the velocity along y direction and velocity along x directions are 0, you are left with only one term and this is the equation that I have derived for one dimensional flow, okay. It is just like you say that, you know, if you have a Windows 7 problem, you cannot really uh, deal a file which, deal with a file which is developed with Windows 10. On the other hand, if you have a Windows 10 file, you should be able to read the one which is developed. So, if you start with a three dimensional equation, you should be able to simplify it and get to the one dimensional form very easily. So sometimes, many times what happens therefore, that we may not really do a shell balance for one dimensional problem. We can take the three dimensional equations, simplify it to our case and then derive or establish the governing equations which is applicable in its limiting form or limiting state of one dimension and so on. So that gives us lot of you know, uh, savings in, in terms of times because if you for every problem, if you have to do shell momentum balance and arrive at an equation, uh, uh, that becomes time consuming. These are all listed in textbooks. I could write this equation very easily because I have been doing it for years now. So if you look at these equations and if you also practice, you should be able to write down the equations. So I have written it must for Cartesian coordinate system, one can have similarly a similar equation written in the cylindrical and polar coordinate system. So the first derivative would be with respect to for example theta, the second derivative of course will be with respect to r and the third derivative will be with respect to z. Of course there are 1 by r etc will come because of the coordinate transformation thing, but nonetheless one can have an equivalent expression of this in the context of spherical coordinate system as well as in cylindrical polar coordinate system. So this set of mass continuity equation and the momentum co balance equation which I am going to write now are available in standard textbooks in tabular forms, okay. So you can just scan through those, you can lift up those equations and start to work for your own problem. Of course, for a given engineering application you may have to do some modifications, but the basic equations for those cases where gravitational pressure, viscous and inertial forces are important all the standard textbooks contain the equations. I urge that you go back, look at uh, you know one of the textbooks I have mentioned in the class and then you can find out 
uh, that how the equations look like in Cartesian coordinate system, in cylindrical polar coordinate system, as well as in spherical coordinate system. So, this is the mass continuity equation that needs to be, and as I said, that this represents this is a steady state problem, no time derivative. So, and so whether it is a steady state or unsteady state, it really does not matter so long as the fluid is incompressible. So, this equation is valid for steady state process as well as unsteady state process provided the fluid is incompressible or rho is not changing as a function of time. Now, if I write down now the momentum balance, I will have three equations, momentum balance or I say mass continuity or mass conservation. Now, I say momentum balance or momentum conservation equations, momentum conservation. So, I can write say in the z direction equation. The z direction equation is going to look like and I will use the velocity which is vz and then and I am writing it in conservative form. I am not making any assumption that density is constant. I am keeping it. If it is constant, I will take it out of the bracket later on. Okay? And then I can write down <coughs> Or I will write like this in some textbooks, they write like this. And you note that the component of Gz is minus g, which is 9.8, because the axis is located in this direction, the gravity is acting as we know in this particular direction. So, this represents now momentum conservation equation along z direction, or we can also say that equation of motion, motion of the fluid along the z direction. I could write the same equation. So, for y direction, and I can write for x direction also. If you look at this equation, the stern represents the net accumulation of the momentum, z momentum. These three terms represents the transport of momentum along the x, y and z direction because of the convection uh, mechanism. And this is the pressure gradient term and this represents the corresponding the shear stress terms as you can see the gradient types of second order gradient type of expressions are related to the diffusion of momentum terms. So, these are these three are the diffusion of momentum along the three direction this represents the gravitational force this is as I have indicated represents the transport of momentum by the velocity themselves along the x, y and z direction or we say that this is an unsteady state term. This represents the first order derivatives, three first order derivatives. You can see one first order derivative with respect to x, the other with y, the other with z. Okay? The first order derivatives we say these are the convection terms. Second order derivatives on the other hand we say these are the diffusion terms, diffusive transport of momentum, these are convective transport of momentum, this is the net rate of change of momentum, this is the pressure force and this is the gravitational force. There is no additional forces involved here. If you say sir, I have you know my problem contains an electromotive forces. So, I will say that look if you want to do an electromotive force balance in that case you have to first find out that what is the j cross b factor, the Lorentz force term. Then the Lorentz force also will have an x component, will have a z component and will have a y component. So, that component along the z direction which will come out from this cross product 
has to be substituted in this particular equation itself and then the, your equation will be applicable to a system where you have electromotive stirring which is present or where there is Lorentz force which is active. So therefore, we require a separate module to compute the J cross B, J is the current density and B is the magnetic flux density. So these are both vector quantities, so you have to do a cross product and then find out that what is the corresponding component along the Z direction, add that up and then your equation now is valid for <coughs> electromotive starting case and I will say in your case now you not only have pressure force, not only have gravitational force but in addition to that you also have an electromotive force and the right component of the electromotive force needs to be substituted. Looking at this equation, one should be able to immediately write that what you know if you, if you spend 2-3 minutes time, I will not write these equations but I will change these equations to the y direction momentum balance and z direction. Let, me, let us now see the tricks. So once you write this particular equation, what we can do now, so let us see, let us make this equation applicable to y direction and then I will say I will replace this y. If you remember, look at this term, the z z term appeared with the derivative of z. So therefore, I will say that this is going to be now my y. I will write small y or capital Y does not matter. Okay. <coughs> so this is now going to be Vx into Vy. This is Vy Vy and this is going to be now Vy Vz. This pressure gradient will now be along the y direction because it is, is and then these derivatives are all you see same going to be remain same but this variable is now going to be not Vz but it is going to be Vy and that is and this time is now going to be equal to 0 because there is no component of gravity along the y direction. So, this does not appear. So, the equation has now been suited for the or applicable to the y direction and now given this, I suggest that once you go back, you do this exercise, you yourself write down the x direction momentum balance equation and then you will never forget. If you look at this in the x direction, y direction and z direction momentum balance, earlier I wrote the z, now I have shown you the y and as I said you will write the x direction momentum balance. You can see that there are three unknowns Vx, Vy and Vz. In addition to that there is an unknown also pressure which is not known to us. So technically speaking we have three momentum balance equation and one more mass continuity equation. So we have four equations and what are the unknowns? We have the unknowns 3 velocity and the pressure component, 4 equations, 4 unknowns. That means the problem is well defined as far as the number of variables and number of equations are concerned. I have assumed that the viscosity and density are the state properties and they remain constant, they are known to you and as a result of which it is a framework we are talking about 4 equations and 4 unknowns that can be solved. Of course, because these are partial differential equations, we have to provide the necessary boundary conditions to these equations in order to comprehensively present uh, the mathematical framework or the statement of the problem itself. So, we must understand that if we somehow say that this pressure we do not have for x momentum we have an equation, explicit equation, x momentum conservation, y momentum conservation, z momentum conservation and a mass continuity. Although pressure appears as an explicit variable here, it is one of the unknown variables but there is no direct equation for pressure. But we can guess that if suppose I have the pressure field given to me, I take it out from my pocket, I substitute it into the equation. So if the correct pressure fields are substituted into the momentum equation, the momentum equation will result in Vx, Vy, Vz which will satisfy the mass continuity always which essentially means it is through the mass continuity that the pressure field is implicitly specified. Okay? So, there is not a direct equation and there is a whole interesting numerical subject, numerical field flow and heat transfer where people are concerned with developing or extracting an equation of pressure from the continuity equation because as I have indicated that having substituted the right pressure into the momentum balance equation results in estimates of Vx, Vy and Vz 
which will identically satisfy their mass continuity, meaning that in the mass continuity equation, the requisite information of pressure is hidden. So, how can one extract, convert this mass continuity equation into an equation of pressure is a whole subject of numerical fluid flow and heat transfer. And those of you who are interested can take some courses in our mechanical engineering department, you know, and know more about the subject. So, we will continue with this uh, in the next lecture and show you that what would be, you know, the number of boundary conditions and because this looks horrendously complex to you, I understand, but it will be very easy to find out that how many number of boundary conditions and what type of boundary conditions can be prescribed over these equations in order to make the statement of the problem complete. Okay.